All right, guys, how's it going? If you've learned anything this week, it's that updating your results when you get something maybe not quite right the first time is a very important thing to do. So I'm going to start this video with an update. If you remember last week in my Coffee Lake paper launch video, I actually also talked about Forza 7 at the beginning. It was a very interesting benchmark, where over at Computer Base they found this result with both Vega cards a crazy amount ahead of the Nvidia cards. Now I took a closer look at it and it looked a little bit like a CPU or driver type of bottleneck on the Nvidia cards. And in fact, at the end of that part of the video, I said that this looked to me more like an Nvidia issue rather than a case of where Vega or even AMD were doing particularly well. And lo and behold, a couple of days later, Nvidia releases their game ready driver just in time for the new Middle Earth Shadow of War game. And scrolling down a bit, we can see game ready for Forza Motorsport 7. Now I'm just going to read this part out. Our driver team spends a considerable amount of time developing optimizations and improvements for the latest games before they are launched, ensuring you have a great experience the second they are available. The work doesn't end at launch, however, as our team continually searches for further improvements in game code and their drivers, collaborating with developers whenever possible. And the fruits of this labour can be seen today in our new Game Ready Driver, which introduces performance improvements of between 15 and 25% in the recently released Forza Motorsport 7. Though you can analyse this how you like, but to me it's Nvidia telling you that their Game Ready Driver for Forza Motorsport 7, it wasn't really game ready. And over at Computer Base, they ran some new numbers. Now, sadly, they've only included the GTX 1080 and 1060 here. But we can see anyway that the 387.92 driver, the 1080 is now ahead of the 1080 Ti. It's still not quite where it should be, on par with Vega 56 and still a fair distance behind the 64. Now I'm saying that's not where it should be, but maybe it is, and you'll see later why I'm saying that. You can also see though that the GTX 1060 is above Fury X, and just a little bit ahead of the 580. That might just be Fury X though. Looking at 1440p and the 1080 is now almost matching Vega 64. And in actual fact, at 4K, the 1080 is now ahead of Vega 64. This was indeed an NVIDIA driver issue as I suggested. It would have been really nice to see the 1080 Ti, especially at 1080p, just to see if there is still some kind of driver CPU overhead thing going on there. But as it stands, it's yet another kick in the teeth for Vega. Some kind of normality has resumed and I remain absolutely unconvinced that Vega will ever really be that far ahead of the 1080 Ti, at least not on a regular basis. Now with that said, I'm going to stick with computer base and I'm going to go back to Shadow of War as we are yet again seeing another instance of Vega performing perhaps better than expected. Starting off at 1080p again and while this one doesn't look quite as bizarre as what we saw with Forza 7, we can see that the Vega 64 is a fair distance ahead of the GTX 1080. 9.5% while being only around 15% behind the 1080 Ti. So this looks like a strong result. I'm just going to interrupt the video here because every time I say something like that, it just does not seem right that I am calling these results strong for Vega when they are just beating the 1080 while still being a long way behind the 1080 Ti. But you know what I mean when I say it, yeah? It's a strong result because it's not 30% behind. But anyway, getting on with it, we can see the Vega 56 is quite a distance ahead of the 1070, which is another strong result. And I'll just tell you how I look at these results, how I analyse, is there something going on here, or are we looking at true results? One of the best ways to do it is just compare the 1060 and the 580. We know that these two cards should be pretty close together in just about every game, they perform almost identically and that is pretty much what we're seeing here. So this could be more of a truer reflection of all the cards. It's interesting to note here though that the 970 is just a little bit ahead of the 390. Not something you see an awful lot these days. But moving on to 1440p, and there's still around a 9% gap between Vega 64 and the GTX 1080. In the Forza 7 1440p benchmark, we did begin to see the Nvidia cards starting to catch up. And that was one of the reasons why I said, nah, this is a driver or a CPU bottleneck. As you increase the resolution, other limiting factors like drivers and CPU, they become much less relevant. We are now starting to look at the actual raw grunt of these graphics cards compared to each other. And it's all looking pretty similar to what we had before. 
up at 1080p. The 580 now just a little bit ahead of the 1060, but there's not a huge amount in that either. And once you're up at 4K, you should be totally graphics limited. And the interesting thing here is that Vega 56 has now overtaken the 1080, and the gap between the 1080 Ti and Vega 64 has actually decreased. And this is the complete opposite of what we saw with Forza 7 at 4K. So the Vega 64 is now only 10% behind the 1080 Ti, while being 21% ahead of the GTX 1080. All of a sudden this is starting to look like a decent card, at least if you're willing to forgive the terrible power draw and the current horrendous price. A quick look at the frame times, there looks like there's one or two blimps there in the Nvidia frame times, but these weren't felt during play. So looking at all this, for me we are looking at the strongest result for Vega, if you discount maybe Dirt 4 where it runs very well under a certain circumstance, for example when using CMAA. This result here looks much more like a true result to me, and by that I basically mean. When you look at the 4K results at ultra settings and we are now starting to see that Vega does have something in there that can take it clear off a of GTX 1080. It's still pretty interesting though because, you know, what could that be? Well, something I try to do as much as possible is use more than one source because you simply cannot trust one source. Something might go wrong, maybe there's something else going on. So always try to use more than one source when there is more than one available. And in this case, another German website, PC Games Hardware, had also benchmarked Middle Earth Shadow of War. PCGH do some very good image quality testing and stuff like that as well. Definitely worth checking this one out, even when using Google Translate. And they even show the benchmark sequence that they run so you can see exactly what is being benchmark. This is very important because it lets other people test and verify their results. Right, so moving down to what we really came for and the benchmarks, ultra settings starting off with 1080p and we can see here that the 1080 Ti Strix is quite a distance ahead of both the Vega cards, that's the Liquid Edition here and the Vega 64 and the GTX 1080 G1 Gaming is just a little bit ahead of both as well. Moving on to 1440p and again the Vega cards have just overtaken the GTX 1080 while still being some distance behind the Ti. They actually do ultra wide benchmarks over at PCGH now as well so if you've got an ultra wide monitor this is definitely worth checking out. But I'm going to stick to the 4K and again we can see it's all pretty similar. In this case Vega 56 doesn't quite overtake the GTX 1080 gaming but both of the 64s do. So it's kind of similar to what we saw over at Computerbase but it has to be said that the Nvidia cards do do that little bit better here at PCGH. But one of the main reasons for coming to PCGH was they did a very interesting test, one that we don't see enough of I feel because they tested Vega with both the high bandwidth cache on and off to see if it makes any difference. And lo and behold, it does indeed make a difference. And here we can see the results of it. Now, in the past I said that the high bandwidth cache should come into play more at higher resolutions and with higher texture quality. That is what the expectation would be. But starting off at 1080p, and we can see that the high bandwidth cache is having quite a large effect of around about 10% on average. Moving to 1440p, and we're down below 5%. That's not really what I was expecting, but that's what it says. And we're down even further at 4K, where there is now hardly any difference. That was on the Vega 64 Liquid Cooled Edition. They've also tested on Vega 56 and found that there wasn't a great deal of difference at 1080p. There's a little bit of difference here at 1440p and a kind of similar not a great deal going on there at 4K. So really, you have to say that the biggest difference, the really kind of surprising thing is how much better the benchmark ran at 1080p with a high bandwidth cache controller on. Another head scratcher maybe? I'm just not entirely sure. I think results like these are slightly encouraging for Vega because it maybe does point to driver stuff that can be ironed out over time. And I'm pretty sure that AMD is putting a lot of effort into figuring out how exactly to get the most out of the high bandwidth cache controller. Now it wouldn't be a door TV if I didn't make a prediction, basically just the same way as I did with Forza 7, where I predicted that yeah this was a driver issue for Nvidia. And they did fix that one really really quickly it has to be said. In that case, case are we looking at yet another driver issue for Nvidia and their game ready drivers? And the answer this time is no. I do not expect these results to change. 
he maybe find that the 1080 can just about take over the 56 or be around that kind of level. But overall, I think that this one is going to be a popular game for the AMD fans and possibly one where Vega 64 looks like it shines relative to other results that we're going to see. Right, so moving on to something a little bit different and one for you semiconductor guys, you should find this one interesting for sure. Looking back at an Intel slide from quite a few years ago, back whenever this chart was released, I guess maybe 2010, Intel started talking a lot about what basically came down to a attrition. They believed that the rising cost of manufacturing would basically mean that a lot of these guys would be finished pretty soon. They simply would not be able to afford a new high-end manufacturing plant on the latest nodes. And they reckoned that by 2015, one 300 millimeter fab would basically only be feasible for those companies making $15 billion in revenue, which was them, Samsung, and I think the ultimate point of this slide was to make the suggestion that TSMC were simply not going to make that. Roll on a few years and they were actually right in many ways. And this is a great slide in fact. We can see here that the number of players with a leading edge logic fab, we can see at the bottom what Intel considers to be leading edge. So back in 0203 it'd be 130 nanometers and there were 25 players back then. But over the years we can see that as it dropped down to 90 nanometers, we've already lost 7 of them. At 65 nanometers we're down to 13. Those same 13 managed to hang in there, around 45, 40 nanometers. We lost another handful though at 32 and 28 and we were down to only 5 at 22, 20 nanometers and nowadays there are only 4 guys left. You probably noticed Global Foundries is one of those. And what actually happened here was AMD, who simply did not have the revenue to continue, they of course created Global Foundries using their old plant. And now Global Foundries are one of the only 4 left. But anyway, we're down to the last 4 and the one that Intel really got wrong? was TSMC because they just went from strength to strength. Basically on the back of the smartphone market, TSMC's customers include guys like Apple, Nvidia obviously, and AMD, but also Qualcomm and hundreds of other companies in fact. They became massive. They built these gigafabs and they created a huge amount of manufacturing capacity and it just brought them more and more money until eventually, early this year, TSMC topped Intel by market value for the first time. And last week we discovered that TSMC are now ready to spend $20 billion on its most advanced chip plant. And here we see that the cost of keeping pace with Intel and Samsung is climbing. But the reality here is it's Intel now who are trying to keep pace with TSMC with TSMC now building a 3 nanometer tech plant. Most of the top we're seeing around about now is about 7 nanometers. And 3 nanometers is not the next one down from 7. 5 is next down from 7 and then it goes to 3. So we're talking about something very advanced indeed and something we're not going to see for quite a few years. And their CEO Morris Chang says by the time that they are through, by the time they've built all the necessary capacity, they think they will have spent upwards of 15 billion dollars. And that is a conservative estimate. Maybe it's safer to to say upwards of 20 billion. And for me, TSMC is now starting to look like the winner. There's only four left. There's been rumours for a while now that global foundries are trying to get out of it. It is just too expensive. Even the oil money coming out of Abu Dhabi isn't enough to keep global foundries in this game. And it is now starting to look like TSMC are in a position where they can't really be stopped. The interesting thing here though is you've got players like Apple and Qualcomm and even Nvidia who are getting much bigger. The last thing they want is TSMC having a monopoly because if you've got nowhere else to go then TSMC being the sole manufacturer, nobody wants this. These companies need to be smart and look at the future as well. So don't be surprised if Apple in particular start looking elsewhere. We've already seen that Apple are prepared to dual source. That's what they did with the A9, the dual source to Global Foundries and TSMC. And there were all those rumours about Apple even buying one of Global Foundries factories, which is something I think might just happen at some point. Only really Apple can afford that nowadays and they're the ones most likely to do it rather than be stuck with TSMC. There's also been talk about Apple Apple and Intel combining, but I'm not even sure that Apple wants to do that either. It's certainly all very, very interesting stuff. In a couple of years, we maybe see another one of these slides and we're down to two players only, or maybe three. But the next time we see slides like these, it's not likely to have come out of Intel Corporation. It's a lot more likely to have come out of TSMC. And finally, 
Remember that old story where Intel and AMD were supposed to be combining tech? Intel CPUs with AMD graphics. I actually quite liked that rumour, but it didn't quite materialise, but the rumour just never seems to go away. And once again last week, over at nasilmactech.com, not one I'm familiar with, but apparently this NLT managed to dig up a photograph of some kind of Intel slide or marketing materials, which clearly shows Vega inside and mobile performance outside. Now it's not the best image, but we can quite clearly see, this is an Intel slide, you can tell them a mile away. And it quite clearly says Vega inside. Now some people said, that's a Photoshop and all that stuff. And it's a little bit blurry, so you're just never sure. Now both Intel and AMD denied this. And in fact, Lisa Su at AMD said, look, we are not in the business of enabling our competitors. Unless you count creating HBM and then letting Nvidia use it. But apart from that, they are not in the business of enabling their competitors. But here it is, a few months later, and we're back to it once again. But a couple of days later, and again we see the importance of updating your articles when you don't get something quite right. It's a false alarm guys, as the whole Vega Insight thing was debunked because it is actually from Intel's employee appreciation campaign. And here we can see Ken inside, and on another poster here we can see Denny is inside, breaking the mold outside. We've got another guy here, can't quite work out his name. And we've got Miko, Paul and Denny once more. It was simply an advertising campaign by Intel. And the Vega Inside image we saw yesterday is actually a poster featuring one of Intel's employees who just happens to have Vega as his name. And he also works in the mobile performance division. What a coincidence. I still like the idea of this rumour though. Right, so that's another video down, covering one or two topics that you probably didn't hear about but hopefully found interesting anyway. Next week, I am doing my mini ITX build. I have talked about this for weeks on end and I never got around to it. There's always something happening that gets in the way. And I know you prefer these videos, but I do need to do the hardware reviews and stuff like that just every so often. So, you know, bear with me until I get this one done next week. And after that, we'll see how it goes. As always, don't forget to check the description for a bunch of links to all this stuff. Check out my new Amazon store, etc, etc. And I'll catch you later, guys.